Alright, so you definitely want your RV to be usable, which is like the whole point of this course. And, in order for it to be usable, it needs to be able to stay where you left it in the water. Now, this is called buoyancy, and you gotta, basically the goal here is to have the ROV not move up or down when you're not driving the motor up or down. So you want to, in sciencey terms, you want your ROV to have the same density as the water. Uh, so, how do we do this? Well, your ROV could be one of three things. One, neutrally buoyant, which is what you want, means it's not going to go up or down. But, it's probably not going to be that way originally. So, you could either need to make it heavier, which would bring it down, and add ballast, or you might want to keep it lighter and move it up, which is adding flotation. So, there are ways to do this. Basically, the best way to add flotation is use something like I have here, which is just foam that you would use. So, what you would do is, if it's too heavy, you might get like a bit of your pipe, and like this stuff has a hole in it. It's a bit big, so you might want to get some smaller stuff. But you could just wrap it around there, stick this in, maybe crank it down with some zip ties, and then mount that bit on your ROV, and it might flow. Now, an important thing about this process of adding buoyancy is you want to keep it balanced. You don't want your ROV to float in the water like this, or else it's basically useful. You want it like this. So, in that case, you've got your flotation. Now, what if it's too light? Well, the way you can do this is stuff nails in the pipes of your ROV, and that adds a fair bit of mass, and you'd be surprised. So, you put your nails in, and it'll sink. Um, one thing you may want to do, because you're using PVC here, is PVC is hollow and can hold air. Now, we're not using glue, so it's not perfectly airtight, but it's a pretty tight slip fit. So, one way you can get rid of that is, you can take your drill and just put a hole, put a little hole in one of these connectors, and then you put it under water and you fill the PVC with water, not air. So. That way you get rid of the air, and one big thing about problem about having air is maybe you're too heavy and you want air, but all your air is just going to go to the highest place it can, which is going to lift your ROV up by one corner, and that's no good. So, well, you may think it would be good, it would be rather unfortunate. Now, the other thing that you may not realize, but you really want, is you also want your tether to be neutrally buoyant, or else it's going to drag your ROV through the water. So. In this case, we've got, first, we'll do a little blurb on how to make your tether. In this case, we've got our video cable and our main ethernet cable, which runs the power down. So, the quick and easy way to do this, what we're going to do here is, obviously you line this up better, but this is just for demonstrative purposes, you just get your wire put it next to this, put them together, and we've got a pile of zip ties here, so why not use them? And I'm putting this on backward. There is a right way around to put zip ties on. Break it down, and now look, you got a tether, and just do this along the whole length. It doesn't need to be like every two inches, but enough so that they don't float around hanging apart like this. Now, once you've got your tether put together, you can just Snip off the extra. Yes. And as always with your zip ties, you don't want this big tail hanging around, so just get down low. Wire cutters, look, it's all good and clean now. But like I say, you want your tether to be neutrally buoyant. So you can get more of this foam, take some scissors or a box cutter or something, and cut just a little bit off the end. And that's a closed cell foam, so yes. it won't fill with water. Preferably have your phone closed cell because open cell means stuff can get it's open. Equals sponge. <laughs> yes, stuff can get into it, so it'll get waterlogged, and then it's no longer foam. It's just mass filled with water, which will actually bring you down as opposed to floating. You. So the scissors are not working too great. So we got a box cutter. There we go. 
you got a little piece, this is a bit much, so in this case the scissors will actually work pretty well. You can just cut this in half. And, and you can just put some foam on there, because your tether will be too heavy, I can guarantee it, from all the experience I've had with this painful process of making your tether mutually boring. And then you can just kind of put this on here. And once again, I don't know, maybe line this up better. You don't like, you don't need too much, especially on a tether this small. So maybe instead of putting zip ties on to combine them and zip ties to put the flotation on, you can just do zip ties for the flotation and holding the tether together. So you just do this and crank it down so it kind of compresses the uh, foam so it won't slip out the ends. Trim it a bit. And there, you got some flotation on your tether. So, there's a little practical demonstration here. What kind of buoyancy do you want to be looking out for? Well, you've got a can of Diet Coke here, and Diet Coke is mostly water. So, but it doesn't really look like that in this can. So, what you kind of want it to look like is if you put this in the water, it kind of hovers in the middle. You can see this one end is lifting up, and that's because this can is not fully filled with Coke. There's a bit of air in there, so of course it's going to go to the top. But, you can see it's not really sinking very fast, and the only part that's lifting up is where the air is. So, you want it hovering just about in the middle there which is the main goal with the ROV. As I mentioned earlier, this also is a good demonstration of why you don't want air in the pipes. It'll do something very similar to this Coke can. You see this end's pointed up because of the air? Well, if you push it down, now that end's pointed up with the air. And this is exactly what's gonna happen with your RV. You're gonna drive around with it pointed sideways. You may hit something, it'll shake around a bit, and now you're gonna drive around with it pointed sideways the other way and it's gonna be pretty hard to control and not be the fun experience we want. So now we're gonna show you how to hook the camera up. So, for our camera, it's not gonna be that bad. What we've got here is the big long cable that you're gonna zip tie to your tether. Um, one end plugs into the camera. Well, this end is probably the end you wanna do it on because this end, you can see it's got the power wires that come out. You don't want to run this all the way up the tether, and you can see it's shorter otherwise. So this side is going to be the one that goes up by your box into the display. This side goes into the camera. For our camera, at least, you just plug it in. And there you go. That's been hooked up. Now, to get power to the camera, well, I'll plug it for now just in case something goes wrong. You don't want to do that. We've got these wires here, red and black, red for positive, black for negative, brown, whatever you want to call it. So, strip this off a bit, get some wire to work with. And then, we're going to need to hook this up to the power. Now, the way I'm going to do it is not the way you want to do it. I'm just hooking this up for demonstrative purposes to show that it works. What you're going to want to do is hook it up in the control box past the on switch you're going to wire up using the uh, cable that comes from this. You So that when you turn the on switch on, the camera turns on. You don't want it just always on whenever you plug it in. You want it hooked up to the on switch. What I'm gonna do is just wire it straight into the banana connector so that you plug it in and it turns on because I don't have the completely control box and switch with me. So what I'm gonna do is, you've got these wires, you just red to red, black to black. Got my soldering iron. And hopefully I can solder this on and just see how well this works on this big connector. If you have the appropriate connector for this, which I don't know if you will, then you can just hook these up to the connector and you can do it as a plug as these are supposed to be used. We don't have that connector, so I have to make do with what we got. Um, you're going to want to do something similar to this anyway with the uh, power switch. Unless, again, if you have the connectors, you're going to want to just get the, your wire that runs to your power switch in your box and either solder it straight to one of these connectors like I'm going to do or cut it off, solder it on, 
And either way, you're gonna wanna cover it in shrink tube so that you stop the shorting from happening. And in that line that goes from your banana plug connector before you get to your switch and that positive, that's where you're gonna put your fuse. So it's the, it's all, the fuse is always the first thing in the line so that if anything goes wrong, it's the fuse that goes first and not anything else. So it's sort of nice that that connector that plugs the cigarette lighter yes. connector has a fuse. Yes. This 15 amp. Dur does come with a fuse. And I think you basically, if you get one of these uh, connectors, it's going to have a fuse in it. So you kind of have to budget your ROV around that. But if it doesn't, then you're going to have to put your own fuse in, which is not that difficult. It can be done easily. All right, so. I'm impressed with how close you hold the solder to where you're actually working. Most people have it dangling around, dancing. Yeah, it's, it's got its benefits and its downsides. On the plus side, with it holding it this close, I can put it exactly where I want to. It's not like this and I'm like, it's all wobbly. But on the other hand, if you're a bit careless with your soldering iron, you're gonna stab yourself in the thumb with a 400 <laughs> degree piece of metal and that's gonna hurt. I've been soldering for four years at least now, so I like to think I'm at least good enough to not light my hand on fire, but you should definitely maybe hold it a little bit further back if you're just getting started, just in case. So anyway, you can see we've got these connected. Um, all right, so our camera should have power. And then on this end, where this goes in, we're gonna plug our monitor in, just goes right in. And then same thing down here, you can just plug this in. And then one thing I probably should have done is get some of that heat shrink and put over this, like I was saying, I don't know why I didn't do that because if these make contact, you're gonna blow your fuse and and remember, one way to stay safer is to stagger the connectors. Cut yes. the wires off at different lengths so that they're not not side-by-side -side connections like that. So, But I didn't do that. I'm just going to be careful and hold these apart. So here we've got our little display. I'll turn the soldering iron off because I'm done with it. And like I say, possibly one of the more dangerous tools you're using. So I got this. We'll plug this in there. Now what I can do is I can separate these a bit more. So that way I have more room to spread them apart. This is kind of sketchy. And there's the masking tape. There we go. All right, lights on. And look, there you go. You've got camera. So. Mr. Robertson's the one holding the camera up, and you can see the display. It's a little pointing it at me right now. It's on this frame here, but there you go, working camera. Now, in this case, we didn't wire it up to our tether with the zip ties, but we covered how to do that, so that's what you're gonna wanna do, and like I say, you're gonna wanna be a bit more careful with this soldering, and you're gonna wanna put it after the switch so that it works with the RV, but, in general, this is how you do it. So in one of the mate competitions, you sit looking away from the pool and everything is done through the cameras. Yeah, for the competition I was in, you're actually, if you look into the pool as the pilot, which is what I was, uh, you get disqualified. So you have to have a camera. So it's very important. Um, definitely one of the most helpful tools you'll have because aside from just it being cool it's a lot easier to pilot the rov when you're looking at it from a first person view as opposed to like from some weird angle going through the water while it's refracting looking all weird so yes the camera is one of the most important tools you have there you got to make sure it works right so brian just showed you how the coke can would be very unstable but has the density very close to water but what is the density of water. So I have here a scale and some bottles of water. And so what I'm going to do 
is put the empty plastic bottle and now I'm going to zero out the scale. So this bottle says on the label all kinds of ridiculous things, 16.9 fluid ounces. Who came up with that stupid measurement? Or it says it's, um, and anyway, and then the last one says 500 mil. So America's metric, the uh, soda, two liter, this is 500 mils, and let's see what it weighs. 495 within the limits of the scale. Here's another one. Put it on. A thousand exactly. So these two bottles of water define that one unit of volume of water equals one gram of mass. Here's a thousand mils. Here's a thousand grams. It's called a kilogram. It's not quite right because it, it needs to be calibrated or the scale is wrong. So which one has the smaller volume? Here we have a thousand grams of water, a thousand mils of volume because the density of water is defined as one. What about here? Here we have a thousand grams and if we put it in the water, it would barely displace the water. So the density of this brass is about seven or eight. And this would make a good weight to make your ROV go down if it's uh, floating too much. So Brian is going to come here and, and show the density of another rather interesting material. Here we go. All right. So this is my first experience with this. since. Mr. Robertson is an old science teacher he has access to questions. <laughs> you mean I've been teaching science for a long time? Yes, yes. <laughs> old is in retired and does substitute. <laughs> so, amongst these interesting elements he has access to is mercury, which is infamously A, toxic, and B, infamously dense. It is extremely dense. So I've never handled this before, but he's got a rather large bottle of it here. So let's... let's That's about $2,000 worth of mercury. Yeah, this is my first time picking it up and I don't really know what to expect. Okay, wow, yeah. So, it's heavy. Um, basically, yeah. Okay. What we, <laughs> could do, what we could do, and we're not going to, is float pennies on the mercury. Yeah. Pennies will cheerfully float on the mercury. Why don't you pour a little bit of it out into the beaker? All right. And now swash it around in the beaker. Isn't that beautiful? Such a wonderful material. Too bad it's toxic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you put that as the um, the weight in your ROV, you would not need much. It would not <laughs> take up a lot of space. <laughs> and you would be kicked off out of the pool so fast. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Okay. So what are you trying to do with your ROV? And we've got a demonstration over here. Um, happy, okay, we'll just leave that. So, happy birthday. Would this work for your ROV? Whoa! No, it would just bob around right on the surface of the water. So, what would happen if I made the balloon heavier by clipping on? Oh! Now, that's not working. I'm going to put it back on the table. So, Look at the magical thing I'm going to do here. Here's a hookup wire and some of the wire is on the table. So I'm going to go snip. Boy, these are cheap wire covers, as Brian just discovered. Hmm. Not quite enough. Not bad. Let's see. Whoops. Wow. So I snip off a little tiny bit more of this wire and I'm dropping ballast. That's what the guys who went to the bottom of the seven mile deep trench did. Okay. 
So let's, normally if this was string and it rested on the table, I, I would have a better way of guessing how much to snip off. We're getting there and we're getting very close and now I'll cut too much off. And is that what you want for your ROV or the Goodyear blimp? And now I've got wet hands and I touch the balloon and down she goes. So we're that close to having perfect buoyancy. And what you would want to do with your ROV is err on the side of having it slightly less dense than water so that um, your thrusters drive it down and you do your thing and then up she goes. Okay, so we can get exactly the same density as air by adjusting the helium, the weight of the balloon, the weight of the tether, and end up with perfectly neutral buoyancy, except the balloon is wet because I put water on it. So why build an ROV? Okay, it's fun. You get to use tools. You get to make mistakes and try and figure out what to do. So here's a, a globe representing the planet Earth. Going up takes you out of the atmosphere and SpaceX and NASA and we got a space station and we're going to go to the moon and Mars. And we're spending billions of dollars to do it. But how thick is the atmosphere? And the answer is, shockingly, the Earth is only 8,000 miles across and our atmosphere is about as thick as the paint on this globe. In fact, if you go three and a half miles high, half the Earth's air is below you and half really spread out is above you. Airplanes regularly fly higher than three and a half miles because the air is so thin they can go fast and not burn as much fuel. But if anything happens, oxygen masks have to drop down for the passengers. So, we as humans have wanted to go up, 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 up. How deep is, look at all this blue stuff. How deep is the ocean? What would happen if you went down three and a half miles deep? Well, the pressure would probably get to you. You'd probably have to go deep in something that would keep the pressure at what you're used to here. How about if you went to the deepest part of the Earth, somewhere over here? Any guesses how deep the ocean is? It's about seven miles. And can you imagine the pressure when you're seven miles deep? If you go completely out of the atmosphere, you're in a vacuum. The pressure here in the, on the Earth's surface is called one. One atmosphere of pressure. If you go 34 feet deep in the ocean, or 10 meters, that's the same pressure as the entire Earth's atmosphere. So if you went 34 feet deep, the pressure is double. If you go another 34 feet deep, maybe some of you have done scuba diving and have gone deep, it's really something. You tend to pop to the surface, so you need a weight belt. Can you imagine going seven miles deep? Well, some brave, brave people many years ago tried to go to the depths of the ocean. And they made it. But then they had to come back. So what do you think they did to try and come back to the surface? So here's a balloon that would pop to the surface. And to make it go down, you need ballast. Oh, that wasn't well, that's a slow descent. If we're going to go seven miles deep, we'll probably need 
a lot of ballast. And then when you get to the bottom of the ocean, you'd better hope that you can drop that ballast and go to the surface. What do you think would happen to this balloon seven miles deep? What would happen to your body seven miles deep? We're okay under the atmosphere because we're used to it. But if we go where we're not used to, like, I mean, whales can dive really deep, but we can't unless we're in a protective hard shell. So when Admiral Perry and the, uh, the Trieste, the bath escape, they called it, went deep, what was in this thing that looks a bit like a submarine? And the smart solution, you can't use gases because they can be compressed. Gases are mainly empty space. Liquids cannot be compressed. Gasoline floats on water. You can go seven miles deep and this giant tank of gasoline is not going to get crushed by the enormous pressure of the ocean. You're in a round steel container with a tiny glass window, hoping that you're not going to get squashed flat. And then when you drop the weights, the gasoline is less dense than the seawater and up you go. So what is the density of the seawater? Well, we saw that density is defined by water. The density of pure water is one. I've got some water here that's a little different. Is this water? Here's a glass of water. What's going to happen? Oh, water's amazing. The, when it gets colder, it gets bigger. Ice floats on water, which is totally, totally amazing. So the water at the bottom of the ocean is generally cold, but it doesn't freeze solid because when water gets really cold, it floats and the ice forms at the top of the ocean. So when you float, you do it by displacing your own weight of whatever you're in. So this helium balloon and the balloon is able to easily displace the, its own weight of air because helium has a lower density than air. Here's some mercury. Whoa, amazing stuff sloshing around. The reason it's so dirty is I used to float lead on it and the lead dissolves in mercury. Here's our kilogram mass. What do you think is going to happen? Whoa, the kilogram floats easily on mercury. In fact, you can tell that its density is a lot less than mercury. In fact, you can Google this. This is about eight-ish because brass is different elements. It's um, an alloy. This is 13.6. So what would sink in mercury? Gold. I've done it. Gold plummets to the bottom of the mercury. Its density is about 19. This is 13.6. But then an amazing thing happens the mercury dissolves in the gold. It's a liquid metal and it dissolves in the other metal. And when you bring your gold ring out, it looks like it's white gold. It looks like mercury. And you have to dip it in concentrated nitric acid to dissolve out the mercury and have your gold ring back. So you better not have any diamonds and stuff in the ring. So let's recap. The atmosphere is thin. And everyone is busy getting out of the atmosphere and studying the universe up there. Almost no one has been putting a lot of time and effort into going deep. ROVs are a relatively new uh, idea. And, being, and um, the oil industry with deep ocean oil wells um, has to use ROVs to go down and maintain them. 
So going up is easy, going down is a new thing. Welcome to the ROV world.